In the last chapter, we have explained why recursion works from the formal view. We have demonstrated it on an example of the ordinary recursion. However, from the formal perspective, there is not much difference between transfinite and ordinary recursion. In both cases, we just need to find the minimal element in a non-empty subset of elements. In this chapter, we are going to see applications of the transfinite recursion with choice. In the third chapter, we have already mentioned the question of whether the cardinalities of every pair of sets are comparable. That is, whenever we take two sets, A and B, whether there must be a matching fully covering at least one of the sets. With some pairs of sets, this is really unclear, say, the real line and omega 2. Omega 2 is an unimaginably long ordinal number. We only know that its cardinality is the third among infinite cardinalities. Regarding the real line, we only know that its cardinality is at least Aleph 1. It is even impossible to prove an inequality between the two cardinalities. Maybe they are of the same size, maybe the real line is larger, maybe smaller. We will never know. Despite this, we can prove that it is possible to compare the two sets, although we are never going to figure out the answer. In the third chapter, we didn't have the necessary tools for proving that the cardinalities of any pair of sets are comparable. Now we have them. Let's go. The basic idea is simple. We keep adding edges using transfinite recursion for as long as possible. As we are using transfinite recursion, we don't stop even when we use an infinite number of them. Once there is no way to add any new edge, we must have filled one of the sets. So in this case, A is smaller or of the same size. It is clear that if the recursive process stops, so we can't add any further edge, we have found a matching covering one of the sets. To finish the proof, we must show that there is no other option. To obtain a contradiction, let us assume that we have used all the ordinal numbers. The class of all the ordinal numbers is denoted with the symbol ON. To every ordinal number, we have assigned a new edge of the partial matching. We can see this also in the opposite way, that we have assigned all the ordinal numbers to the edges of the partial matching. However, these edges form a set. It is a subset of the Cartesian product A times B. So, by the axiom of replacement, also all the ordinal numbers must form a set. And that is a contradiction. As we have seen in the 8th chapter about paradoxes, there cannot be a set containing all the ordinal numbers. Therefore, the process must stop at some point, so there is a matching covering at least one of the sets. In the rest of the chapter, we will be using the same idea, that the transfinite recursion with choice on a limited set must stop at some point. Let's just generalize our setup a bit. Let us first show the generalization on a very specific example where we compare two three element sets. We can consider all the possible partial matchings between them and we compare the partial matchings as usual with the set inclusion. One matching is above another one if it contains all the edges of the other matching and possibly some more. This way we can consider the entire partially ordered set of all the partial matchings. This ordered set has one minimal element, the empty matching and multiple maximal elements, the matchings that we cannot add any further edge to them. So the maximal elements correspond to the matchings that fully cover one of the sets. In our case there are even perfect matchings, but that doesn't happen every time. So we wanted to prove that there is a maximal element of our ordered set. If the set is finite, it is easy to find the maximal element. We start, say, with the empty matching, and as long as we haven't reached a maximal element, we keep adding edges. This is a general method how to find the maximal element in any finite partially ordered set. It doesn't have to be a set of matchings. It suffices that it is finite. But if the ordered set was infinite, we could just go upwards and we don't have to reach any maximal element. To find the maximal element, we need to be able to continue with a limit step. So the question is, what simple condition about the ordered set should we require to make sure that there will be a maximal element? The solution of Zorn's lemma is the following one. 
If we want to get a maximal element in a non-empty partially ordered set, it is sufficient to check that every chain has an upper bound. Let's decode it a bit. We have already discussed chains a bit in the 12th chapter about real numbers. There are such subsets of the partially ordered set, so that every two elements in such a subset are comparable. We can imagine them as vertical paths in the partially ordered potato. An upper bound is such an element that can hide the entire chain below itself. It can be the maximum or the supremum of the chain, or even something bigger. Once this condition is satisfied, it is guaranteed that we can continue with a limit step and climb upwards by the transfinite recursion on ordinal numbers. We cannot use all the ordinal numbers, because all the ordinal numbers do not fit into a set, so we have to reach a maximal element. This statement, that whenever every chain has an upper bound, we find a maximal element, is called Zorn's lemma. So far we have explained why Zorn's lemma is generally true. Now let's look at how to use it. We prove once again that every two sets have comparable cardinalities, this time using Zorn's lemma. A matching covering one of the sets is exactly the maximal element in the partially ordered set of all the partial matchings, so its existence follows directly from Zorn's lemma once we verify that every chain of partial matchings has an upper bound. Well, and that is straightforward. In a chain, every two matchings are comparable in the sense that their union is also a partial matching. To find the upper bound of the chain, it is sufficient to just take the union of all the matchings in the chain. Let's justify that the union is also a partial matching. Conversely, imagine it was not a partial matching. So two different edges meet in a single node. Both of the edges came from certain elements in the chain. However, then just the union of these two elements is not a partial matching. This contradicts that every two elements in the chain are comparable. Their union should be just the bigger matching. This way we have verified the condition and we are done. Actually, almost every usage of Zorn's lemma looks this way. In general, we consider the set of all the partial solutions to our problem, so that the full solutions are the maximum elements. We verify the chain condition by realizing that the union of finitely many solutions in a chain is still a solution and that this is sufficient for proving that the union of any chain is still a partial solution. When the condition is verified, we can apply Zorn's lemma and obtain the required maximal element. Sure, one could argue that the first proof was simpler, clearer, more straightforward, and to a great extent it is true that any proof using Zorn's lemma can be rephrased as a proof using transfinite recursion with choice. However, Zorn's lemma is handy for people who don't want to study details of set theory. To state Zorn's lemma, it is sufficient to explain partial orderings and chains. You don't have to explain well orderings, transfinite recursion, ordinal numbers, or the difference between a set and a class. And that's how mathematics works. One mathematician using one theory derives a tool that doesn't need the theory from the outside, and he provides the tool to others. Other mathematicians can use the tool for their theories, and they don't have to care about set theory. Unfortunately, this means that Zorn's lemma serves mostly as a tool for more advanced mathematical theories, so it is hard to demonstrate its usage on simple examples. But we can show one more example application of Zorn's lemma. How to use Zorn's lemma to reprove the axiom of choice. The axiom of choice states that if we have a set of non-empty disjoint sets, we draw them here as lines, we can pick a single point from every line and create a set out of them. In other words, there is a set intersecting every line at exactly one point. We prove the axiom of choice using Zorn's lemma in a standard way. We consider the ordered set of all the partial choices, the sets which intersect every line in at most one point. A maximal element is what we are searching for. A partial choice we cannot extend, so it has to intersect every line at exactly one point. To prove the axiom of choice, it is sufficient to verify the chain condition. The reason is fairly standard. In a chain, the individual partial choices are comparable. So, it is sufficient to take the union of the entire chain and we have the upper bound. This way, we have verified the chain condition and the axiom of choice is proven. Because of this, 
Thorne's lemma is sometimes referred to as an equivalent to the axiom of choice, but it is a bit misleading given how complex Thorne's lemma is. It would be more accurate to say that we need the axiom of choice to prove Thorne's lemma and that Thorne's lemma is a tool strong enough that it can coincidentally also reprove the axiom of choice. Next to Thorne's lemma, there is also another popular equivalent of the axiom of choice, the well-ordering principle. Let's look at it a bit at the end of this chapter. The well-ordering principle states that we can arrange the elements of any set to obtain a well-ordered set. For example, real numbers are not well-ordered, but we could rearrange them so that they would be. This seems absurd at first glance. After all, there is an uncountable number of them, who knows how much. But the proof is about as straightforward as the proof that every two sets have comparable cardinalities. We consider the class of all the ordinal numbers, and we use the transfinite recursion with choice to gradually put real numbers to them. We cannot run out of ordinal numbers, since it is not possible to cover all the ordinal numbers with a set. This means that we eventually run out of real numbers, and since we have reordered them to ordinal numbers, we have a well order on them. From this point of view, the well ordering principle looks trivial, but it is also a pretty strong statement. It is possible to use it to straightforwardly prove that the cardinalities of any pair of sets are comparable, as well as to reprove the axiom of choice. But I think it is better to just leave these two questions as exercises. I just give a hint that to prove the comparability, the fifth chapter about ordinal numbers should suffice, and to reprove the axiom of choice, the handiest definition of a well-ordered set is that every non-empty subset has a minimal element. In the next chapter, we will use the well-ordering principle to something else. We will finally provide a formal representation of cardinalities, and we will see how we can do the transfinite recursion with choice in a bit smarter way. See you then!